Next, we will hear from Vicki Wachino, Executive Director of the Health and Reentry Project, an initiative to promote public health and public safety that she launched in February 2022 in partnership with the Council on Criminal Justice and Waxman Strategies. Vicki is a principal of Viaduct Consulting, where she advises mission-driven healthcare organizations to advance the health of people and communities. Vicki also served as Deputy Administrator of the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services from 2015 to 2017. And under her leadership at CMS, she oversaw the implementation of ACA expansions, Medicaid and Children's Health Insurance Program, and groundbreaking policies to expand services for people with substance use disorders. We're so grateful she is with us today to share her perspective and some new work. Catherine, thanks so much. And thanks to the Nickham Foundation for highlighting this critical, but sometimes under-recognized um, topic. It's very valuable to be with you all here today. I'm having a slight problem advancing my slides. Let me try that again. Here we go. Now we're in business. Um, so you've heard already from Dr. Brinkley Rubenstein a bit about the, um, the impact of incarceration on people's health. Uh, what I'd like to, co to cover with you today is building on that, talking about the challenges that the health system faces uh, in meeting the needs of people who've experienced incarceration, and then talking about some of the very promising policy changes that are under active discussion now to start changing Medicaid's role to better meet the needs of people as they're leaving. And I'd also like to share with you the work of my health and reentry project, um, and specifically the roadmap that the HARP created with stakeholder input that's designed to lay the groundwork for a vision of implementing these new Medicaid policy changes in a way that advances the health and well-being of people leaving incarceration and engages people across the health and criminal justice sectors, as well as people with direct experience of incarceration in paving the way to these new changes. Uh, as I go through each of my slides, I'll pull out a few key pieces of information and leave the rest to you to absorb um, over the course of the conversation. I'd be happy to answer questions about them at the end. So as you saw from Lauren's uh, slide, um, that had the, the bullseye with the different concentric circles. There are many ways of thinking about the impact of incarceration in the criminal justice system. Today, with this audience, I wanted to talk about the impact that incarceration um, and the way in which we respond to it as health system leaders is affecting the health system specifically. You've heard about the elevated rates of death, including deaths from opioid overdoses, the high rates of public health issues, the high rates of physical and chronic conditions. Um, in prisons and jails. Um, and when you think about that from a health system perspective and the, health, and the community health system that serves people before they're incarcerated and after incarcerated, um, it's clear that our, the way in which we're responding to the health needs of people as they re-enter um, is not uh, sufficiently moving the needle and is also held, holding the health system back um, from some commonly shared goals. So those health system leaders, we think about how do we increase life expectancy? How do we improve public health? How do we advance equity? How do we ad address national crises of mental health and substance use disorder? Um, and how do we avoid use, unnecessary use of high cost settings like emergency rooms? All of those goals are challenged by the data that you see in the slide and that you saw from Lauren a few minutes ago. As you've heard, many millions of people experience either prison or jail each year. Um, and as you've also heard, uh, many of them are disproportionately black and, and uh, people of color. In addition, incarceration is highly correlated with poverty. Um, so I invite you to consider that the population that's entering prison and jail is disproportionately of color and disproportionately poor. 
As you've heard, people who are incarcerated have higher rates of physical health conditions, including both chronic and infectious diseases, um, and very high rates of mental health and substance use disorders. Um, yet at release, although some people successfully reintegrate in the into the community, we see very high death rates from a multitude of causes, but particularly opioid overdose deaths. Um, and you've also already heard about some of the impact that release strategies are having on families and communities. And they're also holding back some key public safety goals. But we may be at a turning point in terms of policy um, and specifically developing reentry policy that can better meet the needs of people as they leave incarceration. Historically, there has been no systematic approach um, to meeting people's needs at reentry. If you were to canvas the reentry landscape, you would see that there are a few bright spots, but no far reaching approach. Um, and as you've already heard, most correctional health services are financed at the state and local level. Um, most services are provided at those levels um, and they're provided independent of the community healthcare system. Um, as, as many health leaders and criminal justice leaders have thought about how to start building towards a stronger approach, um, it has been natural to turn towards Medicaid um, because Medicaid, as the dominant insurer of the low-income population in the United States, has significant reach into the population of people who've experienced the justice system. Um, Medicaid, like private insurance and Medicare, has historically played very little role uh, uh, in, provide, in financing correctional health care services. Uh, Medicaid has been prohibited um, from paying from everything except for community hospital stays since it was created in 1965. And over the past several years, and in particular, uh, since the coverage expansions of the Affordable Care Act have translated into record numbers of people in the United States having access to affordable health coverage, some states and local governments have made progress connecting people to Medicaid services after they're released. Um, and now we have a cadre of policymakers who are interested in creating greater continuity of services for people as they're released by allowing Medicaid to start for the first time covering some services before people leave prison and, and jail. And the idea is that by doing that, Medicaid can provide a bridge to community health care services when people are released and better meet the multitude of health needs um, that people who've experienced incarceration experience. These changes could take place either nationally through Congress or on a state-specific basis through administrative action by the administration. And I'll spend just a moment on each. The federal legislative pathway, there have been a few different types of proposals to change Medicaid's role at reentry. The one that has advanced the furthest is the Medicaid Reentry Act. Uh, which was introduced on a bipartisan basis um, in both houses and would require Medicaid across the country to cover services in the 30 days prior to release. It's passed the House three times. It is currently um, in the Senate um, and remains in the mix for a potential uh, uh, year-end legislative package. In the meantime, not waiting for Congress, 11 states have approached the Biden administration with proposals to allow Medicaid to cover in their states uh, services uh, at reentry prior to release. 11 states so far have submitted reentry waiver proposals to CMS. Waivers are tools that have um, long existed in the Medicaid program to pilot new approaches. And although the specifics of the waivers vary, um, they tend to focus on providing a subset of high needs people who are leaving the, ju the justice system with a subset of services. Generally, they focus on services like care management and connecting people to medication. Um, but in a few cases, uh, states have proposed to provide more comprehensive benefits in the period prior to release. So recognizing that there has been over the past two to three years renewed interest and even policy momentum 
um, around the idea of changing Medicaid's role at reentry. I was lucky to partner with the Council on Criminal Justice and Waxman Strategies to create earlier this year the Health and Reentry pro Project. And the goal of that project is really to identify if we're going to um, to allow Medicaid to start covering their services, how do we break this, this ground? We pulled this project together in recognition that to really successfully implement the changes, we needed input from health system leaders, from criminal justice leaders, from social justice leaders, and from people who've experienced direct incarceration. Over the course of the year, We've engaged more than 70 stakeholders in these conversations, and our work has been guided by a fantastic advisory committee of cross-sector -se leaders whose engagement and interest has been critical um, as, we've, as we've moved these issues forward. Um, our synthesis of stakeholder feedback was released in July and is called Redesigning Reentry. I want to highlight three major elements of rede redesigning reentry, and I'll spend a minute on each of them um, in the, my remaining time. Um, we established guiding principles, high level principles, for how we can execute these changes in such a way that makes a maximum impact for people who've experienced incarceration. We identified the outlines of a new care model that can support people reentering. And finally, we identified seven essential actions for policymakers who are made, who are changing policy and implementing new policies to consider. Our guiding principles focus on strengthening continuity of care, but not just that, doing it in such a way that there's an explicit goal of helping people after incarceration return to their families and communities healthy and whole. Um, those words, healthy and whole, were a North Star established by one of our advisory committee members, Topeka Sam of Ladies at Hope Ministries. Um, and as soon as she said it, um, it got immediate reaction from our stakeholders as a fantastic North Star. Um, some of the keys to helping people return to communities healthy and whole is advancing access to evidence-based clinical services at reentry, but also, and our stakeholders were very clear about this, thinking about the larger array of community services that needs to be in place but too often isn't, that can help people have their health and behavioral health needs met before they ever experience incarceration and ideally would help them. Um, avoid incarceration, and then also making sure those community services are available at reentry. The care model we outline is focused on primary care, um, but primary care with a strong connection and integration to behavioral health services, a clear focus on active patient engagement, a degree of navigation, so helping an individual navigate a system, because historically, uh, people leaving incarceration have been left to navigate systems on their own. Um, in many cases, people will need trauma-informed approaches and, of course, recognizing that health is not the only need that someone has incarcerate, uh, when they leave incarceration, helping people access both health and social supports. And finally, as I said, we identified some key actions for policymakers, and I'll highlight just a few of them here. Um, aligning healthcare services that Medicaid is going to cover with the standards that pertain in the community. Um, and doing that requires an investment in systems and infrastructure. There's very little infrastructure in place in most places in the country to share information and data um, about a person before and after they're released. And those types of investments will be foundational. And then finally, cross-sector collaboration. Um, it was clear, although we had a very group, a strong group of committed leaders um, who joined us in um, our stakeholder engagement, that that was really just the beginning. Um, and the health and the criminal justice systems need to foster greater understanding of each other, speak the same language, and develop common goals um, for advancing the health of people who have experienced incarceration. And that along with that, having community providers, social providers, and perhaps most critically, uh, people who have direct experience of incarceration um, should all be at the table to navigate and implement these changes. 
Uh, I'd like to end by thanking our my partners, um, the 70 stakeholders who engaged with us so actively, and my four um, philanthropic partners, the RX Foundation, California Healthcare Foundation, Commonwealth Fund, and the Schuster, Schusterman Family Foundation. And I'll end by saying the reentry work of HARP is not done. Um, we want to make this reentry roadmap a reality. Um, and if and when these policy changes are made by the federal government and states, we would welcome and look forward to the input of the people on this webinar today on how we can help carry those changes out in partnership with you. There are uh, resources available um, to get more detail on any of this. And thank you all. And thank you, Catherine. I'll turn it right back to you. Thank you so much for highlighting the importance of Medicaid for the re-entry population and for sharing your work on the HEART project.